What's going on everybody? I'm Patrick from Patlax and in this video we're going to be going over the 232 clear. The 232 Clear has become massively popular over the last couple of years, being used by teams like Yale, Penn State, Ohio State, Cornell, Brown. Just a ton of teams are using this Clear, and for some very good reasons that we're going to go over as we move through it. So the first thing we're going to cover is the formation. Why are teams getting into this 232 formation instead of the traditional 3-4 style of Clear? Next, we're going to go over the subbing pattern because one of the things that really took me by surprise as we were implementing this with our high school team was how this helps the sub game so much and how just incredibly important that's going to be for these collegiate teams that are playing in the shot clock era. Next, we're going to go over the clear story. How do we move from gaining possession in our defensive end, whether it be a save or off of a ground ball, to moving into the actual clear, what can we look for until we get into our actual 2-3-2 formation. And then once we're in our 2-3-2 formation, what are we gonna do when they match feet, do a 10-man ride, go into a 3-3 deep zone? And then finally, we're gonna talk about what we do once we've actually cleared the ball. How are we going to sub? Because the sub game is one of the most important parts about the 2-3-2 clear. But before we get started, make sure to check out patreon.com slash Powlax, where you can download and print the playbook PDF that accompanies this and over 50 other Powlax videos by becoming a patron and supporting this channel. The goal for this channel is to put out free, in-depth lacrosse coaching content for coaches and players to access anytime, anywhere. Also, be sure to check out the brand new Powlax Teespring store, where you can get Powlax hoodies, t-shirts, tank tops, mugs, even phone cases, and customize them to fit your team's colorway. So the first thing we gotta talk about is the formation. And obviously, we've got two players in the base, three players at the midfield line, and two players who are going to be about 10 yards over the midfield line on both of the hashes. Now, with two players, in the base, we are going to be able to move the ball from the right to the left side faster than if there were three. And we're going to have a much easier time isolating a two on one versus one attackman versus a 3v2 with two attackmen in the kind of windshield wiper formation. So that's going to be a huge advantage while we're walking the ball up the field. Next, we're going to talk about the two players that go over. And this is pretty traditional in every clear because once we push two players over the midline, our opponent is going to bring two players over the midline, which is going to leave only one remaining player that can cross the midline. And so that's going to bring us to our three players across. These three players are going to be looking for our alpha looks, which is who is guarded by the attackman. And so let's say DM1 is guarded by the attackman. We have M2 step over, which is going to draw their midfielders to this side of the field. And then we're going to have him get back on sides. We're going to move DM1 over. And now we should have an easy outlet because the attackman for most teams will not cross to play defense because no attackman likes to play defense. But probably the most important part about this formation is the fact that now we have four midfielders on the field, two that we need to get off, two that are going to remain, and so now let's talk about our subbing pattern. Substitutions and how we want the 2-3-2 clear to work is going to be based solely on our personnel and what our opponents like to do. If we know that our opponents like to run one-way middies where they got to get their offensive middies off the field, maybe we'll try and send as many players to the off-box side so we can trap some of those offensive middies on their defensive end. That's going to be very advantageous for us. But if we don't have defensive middies that can carry the ball well, and maybe they're dropping into a zone where they're trying to create a lot of traps, then maybe we're going to do something a little bit different. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about our off-box group and isolate our box side group. And so our off-box group is going to be DM2, DM1, and D3. And so they are all going to move to the off-box side. Now, as they move to the off-box side, we are also going to get the LSM and D1 to sub off for M1 and M2. Now, 
wherever we want M1 and M2 to sub onto the field, that's going to dictate which one of these players can cross to the opposite side of the field. Because if all three of these players cross and M1 crosses, now we're off sides, we don't want that. But we also don't want our players to have to hesitate. So we're going to go through two scenarios. We're going to have M1 sub over and then M2 sub on sides, and then we're gonna talk about having both of these players sub to get on sides. If we run M1 over and bring M2 back on sides, this is what it will look like. M1 will leave on sides for the LSM, and M2 is going to come back to the ball for D1. Now, for our off box side, that means this. DM2 is going to be able to go over and set up on the off box hash about 10 yards over. DM1 is going to have to stop at the midline and D3 is going to have to stop at the midline. Now, if they're in a clear and they're moving up field quickly and they can just get over, that's fine. We'll have M2 on side, but either D3 or DM1 is gonna have to stay on sides in that early clear. Now, here's what this gives us if we run over and on sides. First off, we get a short stick ladder on both sides with DM1 and DM2 on the off box side and then with M2 and M1 on the box side. In addition to this, we get a couple of things. First, as the LSM comes off the field and M1 comes on, we gain an advantage of 10 yards in the collegiate game and 20 yards in the NFHS rules where we sub out the LSM on the defensive end, we sub on M1 on the offensive end, and this can create an advantage if they're not subbing cleanly. Now, as we do that, we also will be pulling the LSM away from our clear with our first sub. So as the LSM subs off for M1, they should be subbing off one of their offensive midfielders for an LSM. And if M1 goes to the offensive end, we're gonna pull their LSM away from our clear, which is definitely a good thing. Now, the final thing we're gonna get is if we get the LSM on the field moving to their defensive end, and then we sub off D1, as M2 comes back to the ball, we're gonna get one of two things. If their team is going to be subbing through the midline like we will, we will get M2 versus a defensive midfielder in open space coming back to the ball. If they don't sub through the midfield like we do, it's going to be M2 who is going to be in a one-on-one -on -one situation against an attackman, which is going to be extremely advantageous for us as well. In our first example of Maryland clearing against Penn State, we are going to focus on the formation as well as the short stick ladders on both sides of the field. If we pause it right here, notice how we have four short sticks. These two here on the off box side and these two here on the box side. Now, in order for this clear to work, the player who is subbing out of the box second is going to come back to the ball, receive the ball, and then just easily run it out against Penn State's 3-3 zone. Also notice how Penn State's LSM right here is all the way across the field away from the player coming out of the box to receive the ball. In this clip of Penn State clearing against Rutgers, our main focus is going to be how this player coming out of the box to receive the ball is in an easy 1v1 situation against a short stick because the Rutgers LSM has to respect the deepest player in the Penn State clear. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that the Rutgers LSM is actually playing against the Penn State LSM, and the Penn State LSM actually maintains and stays in the play when the Rutgers LSM decides to go and play the ball. As I mentioned earlier, for me, I would rather have two short sticks on both sides of the field rather than having the LSM be the box side player who goes over. But as long as you send someone deep and make the LSM stay away from this short stick 1v1 we're trying to get out of the box, you should be pretty successful. The main idea is that we are assuming that our opposing team is going to want to sub on their LSM first. So by subbing two players, we are hoping the first First, we'll take their LSM away from our clear, and the second one will match up against a short stick. Now, if we decide to pull M1 on sides and M2 on sides, now what we are going to be doing is first, kind of a bad thing is because M1 is coming on sides, we're going to bring the LSM into the middle of our clear, but it's going to create a more advantageous situation for us on the off box side because none of these players have to wait. So. The first thing is, if we know we're subbing back to the ball, we get two of our best offensive players, M1 and M2, to come back to the ball to try to get the ball from our goalie and D1. This is originally what we were going to do and how I realized we're going to be subbing very quickly. 
Now, the next thing is, if we sub these two on, we can get DM2 over and DM1 over as quickly as possible so they don't have to hesitate. And then, because M1 is going to the middle, that lets D3 move to the traditional position in a 4-3 clear where we have this off-box pull on this side. So if our team isn't used to changing things very easily, we can still have one of the defensemen or the LSM move up to the off-box side at the midline like a bunch of other 3-4 style of clears. Now the final thing that this does is this will allow us to let all three of these players cross if we are moving upfield that way. We, none of them have to check and make sure that they're on sides. They can all just cross because both M1 and M2 are going to have on sides responsibilities. Now if one of these two receives the ball, then D3 is going to have to stay on sides, but then we're going to be able to sub afterwards, so it's not too big of a deal. But if their offensive personnel gets caught playing any of these three, we can definitely stick them on the defensive end if we clear quickly. The majority of collegiate teams are not going to run an onsides onside substitution pattern because, first off, they trust their defensive middies to handle the ball, which doesn't always happen at the high school ranks, and they really want to keep the LSM away from the clear. Now, the main thing that we can show at the collegiate level that happens quite often is getting face-off midfielders or offensive midfielders trapped on the defensive side. So for these next two clips, we're going to show what can happen in those situations. In this clip of Notre Dame versus Hopkins, the Notre Dame face-off midfielder has the Hopkins midfielder trapped on the offensive end. Now, as he's playing get-off games where he fakes like he's going to go off the field and then comes back to the offensive end, it frustrates the Hopkins face-off midfielder into switching to one of the Notre Dame offensive midfielders. Now, with the face-off midfielder for Notre Dame being defended by the Hopkins pole, he decides he's going to fake like he's going to run off of the field, and this is when the Hopkins face-off midfielder would be able to get through the midline off the field. Now, as the Hopkins midfielder goes through the midline, the Notre Dame face-off midfielder goes back in to play offense, receives a pass, causes a rotation in the Hopkins defense, shoots, and scores. This clip starts with Maryland picking up a ground ball and running it out on the clear. Now, as they clear quickly, this does not give the Towson midfielders time to sub off the field. Now, as the Maryland defenseman gets to the offensive end, he moves the ball and then tries to sub off the field. Now, this creates confusion for the Towson offensive midfielders on who needs to stay and who can go. As the defenseman runs through the midline, it causes one of the Towson players to follow him off, which creates space for this additional defenseman to step in and shoot and score. Now that we've got a good understanding of of how we may want to sub. For the remainder of the video, we are going to be using the over on sides method of substituting because the majority of teams use that way. And now we're going to go over the clear story. Our clear story begins before we have the ball. And so we're going to imagine that we're playing defense. Our opponent's in an open set. They're going to dodge the alley with M8. And DM1 is going to play good defense. And M8 is going to take a bad shot that we are going to have a save with. Now, as this goalie makes the save, M8 is watching to see if he scored, not thinking about, oh, I'm going to have to ride now. You know, that's kind of one of the offensive players' things is they're not really thinking defense basically ever. But so as the goalie makes the save, he should immediately look right upfield towards where the shot happened because DM1 is probably going to be thinking, hey, if this is a save, I have space here because this player just dodged, right? So if we can do a quick strike and get up and out early back towards the way the shot came from, that's going to be our first look. Notice that as the offensive player steps in and shoots, he watches the ball, which allows this defensive midfielder to break upfield and be wide open for this goalie's outlet pass. Now, as G1 makes the save, the first thing we want to make sure we understand is that the goalie is going to have time. So in the crease, you have 3.5 seconds before you need to be out of the crease. You don't have four seconds because if you're in for four, you're going to turn the ball over. Now within that four seconds, everybody is going to start moving upfield and that includes all of the riding players, obviously. So the very first thing that we want to make sure that we are doing is we want to sit in space in these little areas right here. Let's say DM2, before he goes upfield, he sees M7's breaking upfield and he kind of just sits in this soft spot right here and the goalie can throw him a nice easy pass right to him. Then he can turn upfield and there's a very 
slight chance that M7 is going to be able to turn him back in open field by himself. Like this isn't this isn't football. He can't grab him. And so our defensive midfielder against an offensive midfielder is probably going to have the advantage in open space. Keep your eye on this defensive midfielder for Hopkins as the Penn State midfielder shoots and the ball is saved. Notice how he has about a second and a half to sit in space as all of the Penn State offensive midfielders are dropping back into their ride or to use substitutions. If we can get the defensive middies the ball in this area and let them turn up field, it will create a momentum that's very hard to turn back for the Penn State riding team because they'll all be running the same direction together. If no one is open, the goalie is going to need to have outlets to the right and to the left. So we're going to set the base in the traditional way that we would. So D2 is going to get out to the right, banana cutting by getting deep wide and making sure to never lose sight of the ball. And so is D1, even though we are going to end up subbing D1 later. As all this is happening, it's not like the attackmen are just going to let the goalie sit there and look. The odds are A2 is going to go get in the face of the goalie. He's going to try to not let him see anything. And the goalie's job as he's in there is to look upfield for one second. If there's a quick strike outlet, we want to hit them. Then if there's nothing there, you get to look right for one second, left for one second, figure out where our advantage is. We have seven, they have six. If there's someone on us, that means someone else has to be open. And then if nothing is there, they need to get out of the crease away from the attackman. Now, in our example, our two-on-one is A2 versus G1 and D2. So here we are just going to have the goalie throw the ball to D2 and we'll pick up with everyone moving up field in just a second. Notice how as the goalie gains possession of this ball, he looks upfield first, then to his right and left to find the base outlets. As he throws the ball to the right, this player kind of walks upfield a little bit, then throws it back to the goalie and subs off. The important thing about this highlight is that we want to make sure we are building the base in the same three down fashion that we usually would, then subbing off the pole on the box side after our base is set. This is going to spread the field in a better way that will allow the goalie to look to the left and the right in a more efficient way to make the easy pass rather than running the defenseman off of the field in the early portion of the clear. Once the player throws it back to the goalie, he can then sub off if he's on the box side. In this clip, notice how after the goalie makes a save, he immediately throws two or three fakes upfield into the face of the riding attackman, then turns and goes out of the crease as far away from the attackman as possible. Now, for a second, this is going to isolate the attackman between the goalie and the defenseman, but then the attackman drops into Penn State's 3-3 deep zone ride. Now, another thing you'll notice about this clip is that Ohio State does not have two defensemen that go to the right and left to fill the base of the clear before subbing out the second pole. Instead, they just have one player stay low because they know that Penn State is dropping into a 3-3 deep zone ride because Penn State prefers to try to cause mayhem at the midline and sub on their personnel rather than to press up field where they don't have numbers. So now that we have our base set and G1 and D2 are moving up field against A2 and kind of just playing keep away as they walk it up the field, everyone else is going to move up field first. And the first thing we want to do is we want to cross the midline with two players. The first player to cross the midline is going to be DM2. He is going to run across and set up on the off box side on the hash, 10 yards over the midline. And the next player is going to be the LSM who's going to sub off of the field. And then M1 is going to sub on in our offensive end. Now, as that happens, the offensive midfielder for them subs off. We get the LSM to come on over the midline, which keeps him out of our clear. Obviously, M7 is going to stay with DM2 as well. Then we want to spread the midline. And so that means that DM1 is going to move to the off box midline. D3 is going to move to the center midline. And now D1 is just going to continue to move up field. And they are all just going to be, the other team's basically just going to be matching feet with them as we move through this portion of the clear. The final thing we have, and we kind of just alluded to it at the beginning of this because it already needs to be happening. Once we set the base, we have to be playing keep away. And so basically D2 and our goalie are just going to move up field. And as A2 tries to play one of them, they'll pass it back and forth. And we're basically playing keep away until we can get to the restraining line. 
In these next two clips of the Yale vs. Penn State game in the early 2019 season, we're going to focus on the shape that both teams get into as they are clearing. In our first clip, the goalie picks the ball up off of the end line, and there's no pressure because Penn State is dropping into their 3-3 deep zone ride, and so the goalie and the defenseman don't have to play keep away as he runs it up the field. Now, as he throws this pass, we're going to pause it and show the formation. We've got our two players who are over, our three players across, including the one at the box that you can't see right now, and then our goalie and defenseman building the base. And like we mentioned earlier, this formation is awesome because it gives both players in the base of the clear three easy pass options. Options. The goalie has the option to throw to the off-box player at the midline, the off-box player who is over at the hash, and the player who is in the center of the field. Also, the defenseman in the base of the clear on the box side can see the player in the middle of the field, the player on the box side hash that is over, as well as the player who just came out of the box. The way the 2-3-2 clear spreads the field makes for efficient decision making, like we see here when the goalie throws the ball to the off-ball player who is over on the hash. In this clip of the Penn State clear, we're going to focus on how, as the base moves up field and walk it up, the goalie could be on the far side or the box side. It really just depends on where the poles are. In our first clip, there were no poles to the off box side, therefore the goalie was able to go to that side. Now, because the pole on the wing started with the ball in our second clip, the goalie comes to the box side as he moves up field. Next, as Yale pulls up an attackman to ride against the goalie, notice that the attackman leaves the defenseman in the middle of the field. Now, the pass is overthrown and they turn the ball over to Yale, but if the pass had been caught, the defenseman would have had plenty of space to walk into the offensive zone, accept any amount of pressure, and move the ball upfield if any of the riding midfielders would have bumped up to play him. Now as G1 and D2 walk it up and play keep away against A2, we're probably going to have the second substitution happen as that's going, but for here, you know, just realize that this isn't exactly how it's going to go every time, and we've got to have both happening at once. So. D1 is now going to sub out for M2, his go who is going to come straight back to the ball using a Maverick, which is basically a cut straight back to the ball. Now, as this happens, what the other team does will give us either a very big advantage or just a regular advantage. So we're going to act like they understand how to match feet and how to sub through the midline because that's going to create the most difficult situation. Whereas if they don't do it, now we just, you know, it's just even easier for us to get up and out. So if they sub out A1 and put DM2 on the field to defend M2, now we basically have one of our top midfielders with a defenseman on their back so that if the ball is thrown to in front of them, they can easily catch the ball, turn, and then make a move in open space and get up and out. If your second midfielder cannot catch the ball and then beat someone in open space, you probably, your team's just probably not as athletic as theirs is, and so we're just not going to be able to have much of an advantage anyway. So as that happens, our goalie will throw the ball up to M2, and now M2 will have a one-on-one -on -one here where they will basically just dodge and try to get up and out. In the next three clips, we're going to see how the second sub can materialize in three different ways. In our first clip of Maryland, the goalie is bringing it up the off-box side. There's no one available, so they swing it to the box side, and at this point, all of the Penn State players have to shift over. And as they do that, they leave the second sub coming out of the box wide open. He receives an easy pass and just trots right upfield over the midline. In the second clip, we get the same kind of switch the field concept where the off-box defenseman throws to the box side goalie. Now, as the second sub comes out of the midline, he is now covered by the Rutgers short stick defenseman. He squares him up, dodges towards the sideline, turns the corner, and crosses midfield. At this point, he draws the LSM, and his own LSM would be available for a pass, but he decides to just dodge the long stick, and the clear is successful. In our third clip, once Brown gains possession of the ball, we'll see that the defenseman and goalie will walk it upfield and play keep away. Now, we want to keep our eyes on these two defensemen subbing off. As they sub off, they're going to go over and on sides. Now, the on sides player comes, and he's defended by the LSM, and we've got nowhere to go with the ball. Now what actually happened here was the player who subbed on over the midline did not draw the LSM and that was actually a mistake made by Cornell that you see here as he drops into his defensive zone which frees up our second sub. 
Now, in this situation, we would want to make sure that the player who subbed on over the midline would notice that he was wide open and draw enough attention that our base players could throw the pass up and over to them. Now, had Cornell made the decision to send the LSM on and into the defensive end with the first sub who subbed on over the midline, our second sub would have been wide open. It would have been a very easy read. The key to this is that as players are subbing onto the field, they must be aware of whether or not they are open, call for the ball, draw enough attention as they need to if they're open, and make sure that our players know where the easy outlet is. So if none of this works, say the other team does a great job of shifting in their 3-3 zone or they match feet incredibly well and we're not confident in our player to have this nice one-on-one -on -one against a short stick, now we are going to see exactly how this clear is going to work settled against specific rides. Now that we're in our settled clear, we have to know what we're going to do against a variety of riding options. And our first one that we've been going over the whole time is if they match feet. If they match feet, we are gonna to need to push to either side with the goalie or D2. So here, let's say A2 is playing the goalie pretty hard. Our goalie is going to throw the ball to D2 and then D2 is going to want to move up field and push towards M8 and isolate him with DM1. So here we're going to have DM1 move to the middle of the field and at this point either D2 or DM1 is going to stay on sides and M8 is going to have to choose who they play. So here let's say M8 goes with DM1. That is going to give D2 an alley to go over. If M8 decides to move and defend D2, then DM1 will be open and D2 can just pass the ball to, to DM1. And now DM1 is up and out and we are still on sides. In this example, Yale is in more of a 3-3 zone that's going to bump over rather than matching feet, but we're going to be able to explain the principle here anyway. As the defenseman pushes upfield, the off-box player goes over the midline, creates space, and the defenseman throws a little dink pass over to him. Now, if this riding player would have been matching feet, they would have been able to cross with this player and we would have had no advantage like we did. And in the situation where they're matching feet, if the off-box player comes to the middle of the field and the defenseman shows like they're going to run over, the riding player is going to have to make a decision. Whichever player he decides to play will get the other one the ball and then we'll be up and out. Next is, what do we do if they run a 10-man? And so if they do run a 10-man, here's what's going to happen. The LSM is going to bump up into the middle of the field. A3 is going to bump up to D2. And now we've got one-on-ones all over the field, but the goal is going to be open. So in this scenario, the best thing that you can do is beat someone. If you beat someone, you kill the 10 man. So as A3 comes to play D2, if D2 can just beat him and get up and out, now we get into the same scenario where DM1 is going to be playing with D2 against M8 in a two on one. Now, the key to this is as A3 is kind of racing behind D2, if M8 jumps upfield and tries to play D2 and we can pass the ball to DM1, now we have a two-man advantage moving upfield because in a 10-man ride with the goalie pulled and an extra defensive player upfield, anyone who gets beat creates two, a two-man advantage on the offensive end because the goalie is going to have to run off of their attackman once we get close enough to the goal. It's basically the best numbers situation you can have. Now, if their 10-man ride works really well and we can't beat anybody because they're more athletic, we may have to do something else like just shoot the ball at the open net and maybe we plan to have a seal of some kind to free up an attackman that's going to get back up and be closer you know, to the end line once it goes out. But with that 10-man ride, we're hoping that one of our athletic defensemen can beat one of their short stick attackmen. In this clip, we're going to see Maryland clearing against High Point's 10-man ride. They start with the shorty low clear, swing it to the goalie, swing it over, and then they throw it up to the second sub coming out of the box who runs into an immediate double and throws it back to the defenseman. This throw from upfield on the clear back to the defenseman is a really great idea versus a 10-man ride because it should make an attackman go down to pressure the defenseman, which is going to spread the players out and help us isolate one-on-ones and try and win the one-on-ones. 
Now, after the ball is thrown to the opposite side, it is then immediately thrown up the wing to the off-box player by the goalie. Now, I don't think this was the best idea, and at this point, we're at 16 seconds, so the Maryland player just shoots it on goal, misses, and high point gets the backup. Let's rewind it just a little bit and talk about the strategy that Maryland uses here to clear against the 10-man ride. What they show here is that they're bringing as many players into their defensive end as possible because they'll have seven and high point will have six. Now, although this tends to make sense numbers-wise, it doesn't really make sense spacing-wise because with so many players in such a tight space, we actually actually just end up congesting everything and allowing the high point players to step from one player to another within these zones and then ride up field and create a bunch of traps and doubles. What we would actually want to do is what we normally do and send at least these two players deep and maintain our formation. That way, we're going to pull two of their players deep as well, and then we're going to have a lot more space to run five on five and try to beat somebody one on one. If we pull these two players and put them in the offensive end, we are going to pull this high point player and another high point player into their defensive end as well, which is going to give us more space. Now, once the goalie catches the ball, if he pushes up field, he's going to draw this high point player, which should leave us with the one-on-one -on -one either here or here for the goalie to choose between. Now, if our opponent decides to run a 3-3 deep zone ride, we're going to use alphas and dragons. And so a 3-3 deep zone is essentially three zones created by the LSM, M8, and M7. And so basically anyone who comes into this zone will be defended by M7, then M8, then the LSM. And so we're going to want to use alphas. And alphas is basically who's defended by an attackman. Right now, that's all three of our players who are spread across the midline. We're going to want to use the ones that are farthest apart from each other, which clearly is M2 and DM1. So let's say we think this is our best matchup because we got a defensive midfielder. It's a shorty. He'll be defended by a shorty after he crosses. So the goalie is going to throw the ball to D2 to shorten the pass. DM1 is going to step over. And if he has time to deliver the ball to DM1, because M7 is too slow, he'll do that. But let's say that M7 does not allow him to throw the ball. Then we're going to get M7 is going to come all the way over to defend him. M8 is going to have to shift over to DM2. And the LSM is going to have to shift over to M1. Now we are going to pull DM1 back on sides. We're going to push M2 over. And now with the LSM... M8 and M7 all the way on this side of the field, they're all going to have to bump back over. So M7 is going to have to come all the way back to DM2, M8 is going to have to come all the way back to M1, and the LSM is going to have to pick up M2. Now, that's going to take quite a bit of time, and we can move the ball faster than they can run. So D2 is going to pass the ball back to G1 to shorten the pass, and G1 is going to throw the ball up and over to M2 as he crosses because it's going to take the LSM too much time. Those are our alphas and that's how we would manipulate using the alphas. Now we've got one more part and that's the dragons. And dragon basically means drag, which is essentially we're going to move with and into the wakes of these defensive players as they move. So let's say this LSM is extremely fast, but M8 is not as fast. That means that as the LSM leaves M1, M1 is going to have a bit of space. And if M1 comes with and follows the slide of the LSM, M8 is going to have a long time before he can actually get over to cover M1. That should leave M1 open and we can find the dragons within our clear. In our first two clips, we're going to show very easy alpha passes. So as the defenseman here throws the ball over to the goalie and all of the zones shift towards the box side, the off-box player who was defended by the attackman moves deep into their offensive zone and the goalie throws a nice long overpass to him. In this next clip, as the goalie walks it up, this player realizes he's guarded by an attackman, he steps over the midline, receives an easy pass from the goalie, and we're out. In this clip, we're going to show how the dragons work. To start the clip, this player will start with the ball, and I want you to make note of number 13 here who is covered. Because he is covered, this player is going to throw the ball across the field. As the ball is thrown across the field, I want you to focus on these two things. First, you're going to notice that number 13 has his stick in the air. This is going to let the box side midfielder know that he can step across the midline. As the ball goes over and the Penn State player crosses the midline, this is going to force all of the Maryland players to shift their zones to the box side. 
As the goalie on the box side catches the ball and looks upfield, all of Maryland's zones have already shifted and there's nobody open, so he decides to throw the ball back the way it came to the off-box side. As the ball is thrown to the off-box side, notice that the Penn State player who stepped over is now getting back on sides to release number 13 to step over. As number 13 steps over, it causes the Maryland zones to shift to the off-box side, and this creates space for the Dragon, number 26, to cut back towards the ball, accept a pass from the defenseman, turn up field, and we're into our offensive set. Now we're going to go over how we want to sub through the midline after we've gotten the ball to our offensive end. Now we're going to act like we know how to control the ball in our offensive end in a five on six scenario so we don't have to talk about you know moving the ball but understand that once we try to sub a player over the midline we are going to be in a five on six scenario where the defense has the advantage so if we don't move the ball or we can't like run around quick enough if we're lazy they're going to be able to get a free double because we're pulling a player off of the field now so we're just going to eliminate that fact from this and talk about the mechanics of subbing through the midline so any sub through the midline is going to have three components a defenseman will sub out for a midfielder here in our clear. We've already done that. D1's already off the field. M2 is now on the field. Then we're going to want to pull a midfielder for a defensive midfielder. So this is our defensive midfielder. We're going to want him to sub with our midfielder. So we are going to call Oscar, which means over the midline, and DM1 is going to come over the midline. And once he's over, M2 can come onto the offensive end. And now DM1 is not done until he goes all the way off the field because that will allow us to either put our defenseman back on for the defensive midfielder. So our defensive midfielder comes off for a defenseman or in this example, it's going to be our next sub, which is OM1. So now once OM1 goes on the field, now we're gonna call DM2. DM2 is going to come over the midline, and then once he comes over the midline, OM1 can go on the field, and now DM2 is not done till he gets off of the field, and D1 can come onto the field, and now we are just set. We're into our offensive end. We should be good to go from there. Now, there's a lot of mechanics in how we might want to sub through the midline, like if we want to set a pick up top, if they're trying to match feet and marry and run over the midline with us, if we set a pick using the player that is coming off the field, the player defending that player is going to have to defend the switch, which means we could gain an advantage, and we'll go over that with video right now. In this clip, Hofstra is going to try and keep one of Hopkins' offensive midfielders on the defensive end by having this LSM set a pick and then run off the field. So Hofstra sets up a big dodge up top, the LSM comes out to set a pick, and now what would usually happen here is the player defending the picker is going to have to evaluate whether or not they're going to switch or stay, and it's going to make them show to the middle of the field, which should give the LSM a few yards advantage in getting to the midline. Now, in this particular situation, Hofstra Hopkins shows from the crease to allow the offensive personnel to get a good jump and chase the LSM out through the midline, but overall, the LSM does get a nice step on the offensive personnel. Now we're going to set the picking subbing game aside and talk about how the 2-3-2 clear allows you to sub faster and show how we are going to be subbing through the midline. As we begin this clip, let's clarify where these players are going to go. This player is going to go off box over, this player is going to go off box midline. This will be our first sub, this will be our second sub, and this player is going to find himself in the middle of the field. Now as the clear starts, we build our base with the goalie and the defenseman, and everybody moves up field. Our first sub happens, our second sub happens, and our second sub gets the ball. Now, as he runs the ball over the midline, we've already subbed two of our offensive players onto the field, and now we just have to buy time to get our last player onto the field. Notice how the final sub can come on the field once the defenseman subs out for them, because the off-box over player has gotten back on sides for them, and now the off-box over player will sub out so we can get the third defenseman back on the field. In this final clip of Penn State, we're going to show how we're going to sub all three players if we push all of our defensive personnel into the offensive end. Yale does a great job here riding and only gives up this pass to the pole at the center of the field. Now, they were probably wanting this because as the pole carries over, they press and try to take the ball with the LSM. The pole does a great job to run around. He actually has a nice little rocker here, almost takes a shot, and then passes up to a great matchup up top where Yale's pressure is no longer a factor. Now, the pole subs through the midline. 
the LSM subs through the box and we get our first two offensive personnel on the field. The ball is passed to the offensive personnel and we get our third sub through the box. Now the only thing I have to make note of about this subbing pattern is that they did not go one at a time. Having the pole and the LSM sub at the same time can be risky if you're playing a team that likes to pressure a lot. But so the most important part is the fact that everybody understands the mechanic of subbing through the midline, which is defenseman for a midfielder that's going to be coming to the offensive end, then the defensive midfielder that's in the offensive end needs to sub for the midfielder, the fresh midfielder through the midline, then the defensive midfielder that's subbed over the midline needs to sub out for the original defenseman that subbed on for the fresh midfielder. Once people understand those three mechanics, subbing through the midline is a breeze. It just takes a little while for players to like really see it and visualize it happening. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Definitely let me know what you guys thought down in the comments section, especially if you end up running this with your team. I would love to know the pitfalls that you find. I only had basically the first two weeks of the season to implement this, so I'd love to see kind of what others see if they start to build it throughout this next off season. Make sure to check out patreon.com slash Palax where you can download the playbook PDF to this and a ton of other videos. Essentially, you pay five bucks a month to help support me in the creation of all of this free content that anyone anywhere can use on YouTube. And in supporting for $5 a month, you get access to every single playbook PDF that I have ever made. I wanna say we're in like the 58 Eight different playbook PDF range at this point, but so definitely make sure to check that out. Also, if you're on social media, on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, check out Palax and my personal page of Patrick Chapla. Finally, you can also support Palax by buying swag through the Palax Teespring account. I hope you guys really enjoyed the video. Have a good one. I'll see you guys next time.